77th is only 12 square miles. It has over 400 churches, but historically, it has the highest homicide rate in the entire city. You're either aligned by circumstances or aligned by choice, but you are aligned based on the neighborhood. You have those friends that you grew up with since elementary school. Those four friends are gone. Three of them are dead, and one is in life without possibility of parole in the penitentiary. We all have to be educated regarding this crime called murder. We can't put it into the gang banging. We can't put it into drugs. We can't say it's domestic violence. No, it needs to stand on its own. You don't have to add anything additional to it, like robbery or anything like that. It should be murder, and murder should be considered the worst crime of all. Homicide requires character. It's not just going and arresting bad guys. This job can be very tough and can be very painful. The main thing I think that makes us so effective in this part of the city is the bond between the detectives that work homicide, specifically homicide, and the community. This is Sal. Sure. Where at? Is the body still at the scene? Okay. I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm in bed. So just, just driving time. Let me get ready. All right, see you guys. I've been touched by probably at least 7,000 homicide investigations, whether they are cases I responded to, cases I handled, cases where I've answered the telephone, cases that have been discussed in my office. Basically, I look at it as a homicide detective. The units I've been assigned to, we've handled a little over 7,000 homicides. When that phone rings, whether it be for myself or, or especially the investigators that are handling a particular case, there's that frustrating sense that you know one murder is one too many. I mean, one murder just affects hundreds of lives, whether it be the victim's families, the detective's families, the neighborhood, the community, the news media, I mean, the churches, the hospitals. There's so many lives affected with the loss of one person through violent death. So when, you know, that gunshot rings out, when that, you know, the two inches that could have saved a life or taken a life happens, there's that frustrating part of, wow, we've done so much and people still have this, you know, violent streak or this, why is it, you know, these, why are these two gangs going at it? Why is this person going out, you know, committing a robbery and the shooting? You know, I hate when people say, oh, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time. There's no wrong place, and there's no wrong time.
I mean, unless you're committing a robbery and you're in a bank and you get shot, well, guess what? You were in the wrong place at the wrong time because you were doing something bad. You send your child off to school, you don't expect that him, him or her to get caught up in, in the crossfire of a shootout. Your husband goes off to work and is driving home at 1, 2.30 in the morning working three jobs, and you don't expect him to get caught up in a robbery gone bad where, where that person gets shot. They're not in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's where they're supposed to be. You know, people often ask, myself or other detectives are always asked the question, you know, what's the, your most memorable case? What's the most violent case? What case stands out, you know, with you, you know, over the years? It's difficult, I mean, at least for myself to answer, and maybe it's because of the, the many years that I've spent here, the many years that I've seen, you know, so much violence in, in so short periods of time. I mean, I've seen, everything, you know, decapitations, I mean, mutilations, shootings, stabbings, I mean, all kind of deaths, all kind of manner of deaths. And it's not really the gruesome ones particularly that stand out. It's it maybe the people involved, maybe the victims, maybe the, the day, location, or the, the time of the year. Can you show us the six on Normandy? 24 Mary Queen 76, Mary Queen 48, traffic stop on Lord Tom, Adam Charles, 537. If you put the 80s and 90s in context in Los Angeles, we averaged 1,100 homicides a year in the city of LA. The large portion of those were in South LA. We had a police department that was about 8,000 officers, so we weren't staffed as heavily as we are now. And everything we did was about suppression. Years ago, there's no way I ever would have dealt with the police department. Back then, the police was a little bit more aggressive. For as they had to do anything to you they want to. Pull you over, talk shit to you, cuss you out, hit you upside the head, whatever they wanted to do to you. And this is a community under siege with drugs and gangs and murder. And we have the worst police force in our communities trying to kill it. They weren't trying to fix it. They weren't trying to arrest it. They were trying to suppress it by any means necessary. In the 80s, we would do what was referred to as an operation hammer, a hammer task force. And we were bringing two to 300 extra police officers on a Friday or Saturday night in South LA trying to do something to stop the violence. And they stereotype you real quick. All you gotta do is be walking down the street, one or two people, and they gonna pull you over, run your name, find out where you're at, what you're doing. And if you slip up and say you in the gang, they're going to mark you down on that little card, and you'll be labeled with a gang member from then on in. It was somewhat effective, but what we didn't see at the time, that suppression model alienated the community. As a citizen in between the two, there was no place for me. They were going to do what they were going to do, whether I liked it or not. And the street was going to bite back against them whether I liked it or not. So they were butting heads with each other. We didn't see the long-term impact of that. And so when Rodney King happened, we had no support. We had no relationships. He wasn't a member of this nightmare. He wasn't a participant in this nightmare. But they beat him like he was. They beat him like he was a gang member they were trying to suppress. And so having lived through all of the 80s and into the 90s and seeing that, now everything I do is based on my partnership with people in this community. And with those partnerships, we see a reduction in violence, we see a tremendous increase in trust in the police department. 
Uh, and with that increase in trust, the relationships get stronger and stronger and stronger. It's like anywhere else, it's like a family or anything else, it, it works. We went from a nightmare to newness to the possibility of greater. So are we done? No, no. Last week was a pretty uh, amazing week. A lot of search work, a lot of work. Castaneda and Kirby arrested a guy on the 119th May. They could have been anything else. You could have been in robbery. You could have been, you know, something else. But to decide that you're going to be a homicide detective, that takes a lot on. As far as our numbers, our three respective divisions is down about 19% in murders. So that's real good. Last year was a good year. This year, it looks like it might be better. You don't even have a clue who I am. You don't know my child. But you're willing to take a chance to find out who killed him? Yeah. Hey, I just wanted to uh, thank you guys yesterday meeting with that family in, in Southwest. That was, that was really nice. That lady drove all the way down from Vegas. That murder occurred 17 years ago. And uh, we met with her yesterday. She just wanted to thank them, even though the case isn't even solved, just for the diligence to stay at work on the case. That says a lot. The attributes that are best to have as a homicide investigator is the passion for the job and the passion for the people. The knowledge will come about crime scene management, about crime scene investigation, interrogation law, writing search warrants, all those things can be taught. What can't be taught is the passion for the job and the love of the people and the love of the job and why you're doing it. How you doing? What you doing, bud? I ain't seen you since you was on my side. Okay. How you oh. Hey, how you doing? Come son? here. Hey, sister. How are he, you? He worked hard on my son. My son was killed. Mm hmm Murder, y'all helped me member? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Today's birthday. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. How you doing? So when I look at selecting people for homicide, I'm looking at what's at their core, what's motivating them. They're just passing through here trying to check a box, say, hey, I worked homicide for a couple years and move on. Although that may work, that's not the ideal homicide investigator. The ideal homicide investigator is someone who looks at it and knows it's a calling. It's something that they want to do. They're not doing it for any reason or short period of time. This is, this is what is in their DNA. Y'all work so hard, people don't know. Y'all y'all go home and y'all take this with y'all. Y'all make it personal, yeah. you know? And I love y'all for that. Well, thank you. Y'all work you. so hard, people never tell y'all thank you. Oh, thank you. The victims, we the victims. Oh, you're right. You know the family. I love y'all. Thank you. Y'all keep up the good work here. Okay, sister. Right. Let's talk to you. In some aspects, being a homicide detective here is the same as it is anywhere else in the country. They interview witnesses, they process evidence, they chase leads. But the great success that we have had in uh, South LA and South Bureau has been the fact that we're working extraordinarily hard to build relationships in this community that are influenced by gang violence. All these gangs will have a hood day every once in a while, which is like the day they, you know, lands on a certain day of the month that coincides with the number of the street they're on or whatever case may be. And 40's had a hood day recently, and I love a party and, you know, drink and whatever. And one guy ran through a gun, they got that guy, and then they had about 30 other guys jammed up along this driveway over here of this blue apartment, blue home here, right down the driveway. And so everybody's complying. We had them lined up all the way down the right side of this driveway, and they had three racks of ribs, three or four big racks of ribs on the grill. He said, I ain't seen our ribs are gonna So I ended up I cooked I cooked their ribs for a while. Everybody ran their names for warrants. I took them off the grill. I could they were being cooperative. I couldn't see letting their ribs burn for nothing. They offered me some. I said, Oh come on, all you big guys, you can polish all these ribs off in a half a second. What's up guys? What are you eating there? Hot Cheetos. Where's the where's the soda? You don't need it? Not with those hot Cheetos? All right, all right, all right be good. For a while, we were deployed down here for quite a bit, and they moved us to 77, so usually we bounce it between Southeast area and 77. Every once in a while, they'll send us to the harbor or Southwest. Shooting just occurred Broadway and 112th Street. Broadway and 112th Street. Code 3 incident 3525. Already 1842. Okay, you know, just there, Broadway. Broadway and 112th Street. Code 3 for Main and 4 
By the time we as homicide detectives are called out to a homicide scene, we're already chasing. We're at least an hour to two hours behind whoever perpetrated this crime. horrific part, I think, comes and goes as a homicide detective, that's not what I'm focusing on. I'm not focusing on how bloody or how horrible this person was murdered. It's who murdered this person. Who did it and when and what information do I have? I want to start that chase now. horrific part or the emotional part has more, I think, to do with connections with people. Usually it's somebody in that victim's family or who's close to that victim where there's some, there's, there's that empathy connection that's made between a detective and the case. And that empathy connection, as I would describe it, is what drives that detective to try to solve it. Do we solve them all? No. But that's what pushes us, and our goal is to solve them all so we could give some kind of answers to that family of what occurred to their loved one. The 
family members of our victim, rightfully so, are staying at the relatives so that way they can feel safe. We want a particular person who may be able to convince witnesses and other people to come forward. Not that they weren't telling us the truth, but if they were holding back certain information because of they were fearful, you know, of a retaliation. I can provide the protection, the safety, mm -hmm. right? I could provide the, the closure. Mm -hmm. Myra and I could provide all that stuff. Yeah. But I can't, and Myra can't, we cannot help your family unless you guys are willing to help yourself. I agree. That's what I've been trying to implement in them now. Like, you know, she says she'll talk to you guys. It's just like, I just want to make sure you're safe. Just wait, once this case breaks open, mm -hmm. we have to protect you. Yeah, I agree. Right, right now, we can't do much because there's really no imminent, they call it imminent threat. In other words, he doesn't know that we're talking. They're not going to know that we're talking yeah. until we start solving the case. Right. And then, that's once when we solve it, but that's when I, I have to. Hoovers, we all know about Hoovers. I live with them all my life, and I know they ain't no joke. And that's one gang I'm afraid of. But, I mean, at the same time, though, it's like, let's be realistic here. I mean, are we doing this for Uncle or are we not? I will tell you right now. I know the, the fear is the retaliation of his friends. What he did was... Not for the benefit of the gang. It no, wasn't. It was personal. It was yeah. personal. Yeah. So you think the, the gang is going to stick up and do certain things that will get themselves into more trouble? And no <laughs> gang accepts a guy killing a girl over something stupid. You know, it was an argument. It was that was not business. You know, <laughs> gangs are about business too. It's about money. No, let's identify who this person is. Mm -hmm. And then Myra and I will do our job to try to remove the family members as much as possible. We have okay. other techniques. Okay. The longer we wait, the, the longer, longer I know. 48 hours taught me that. Thank you. <laughs> and you know, it will, it will be a distant memory. Your cousin will be a distant memory. I know. I don't want that. That's not fair. I agree. I agree. This family hasn't been back to the house since the night of the incident. So every time she went up and down the stairs, and because that's, that's where, where she. she Held her daughter. I feel really bad. Oh, yeah, you know it took everything you know, me not to cry. <laughs> you, and I, you and I are weak like that. You know that? You feel horrible for them. You know, because it's reality. It's not, you know, it's not TV. It's not, this is real. Real people's lives. It's, it just takes a toll. About midnight, got called by the uh, Southeast Watch Commander that we had a homicide here on 95th Street by 95th and Fig. Female black was shot and killed as she was walking on the sidewalk. Um, There's probably a group of other individuals out when a light colored uh, sedan or SUV drove by, depending on the witness's statement, shot multiple times. She got struck by gunfire. Latoria, L-A-T-O-R-R-I-A. Patrol units respond, paramedics respond, they pronounced her deceased here at the scene. So by the time I get here, it's the, the scene's already secured. I had some idea where some pieces of evidence were. Had some fired casings. Had some cell phones that probably belonged to our victim after she got shot. A couple of iced tea cans and one was still, you know, half full. That would indicate there was more people out here. So it's that type of stuff that we're just kind of processing the crime scene. There was a van obviously close by. Did you find something else? Huh? Yeah, perfectly intact bullet. Oh, there it is, right there in the window. Yeah, very nice. I have, I have measurements if you want to go off the measurements I have. Okay, then I'm going to get the light post. Right I have the light post. I have this light post and that light post. Perfect. Perfect. Almost like you've done three. this before. Never done it before <laughs> in my life. Really, Solid. first time out here. Solid. <laughs> Mel Hernandez and I will be personally assigned to this case until we leave. I don't plan on leaving. I plan on retiring from this division. In that case, it'd be assigned to me until I retire. We form a bond with that family, and we know the investigation best because we 
were the first homicide detectives who got a look at the crime scene, who talked to the people who were involved that night, to the, to the community members. So as a result, you have some personal attachment to the homicides that are assigned to you. My only child was murdered, Reginald Lakeith Reese, December the 6th, 1995, in San Pedro. To have your kid leave before you at the hands of someone else, that they have touched your kid, it's like your brain's supposed to be in a circle, but when that happens, it leaves a little dent in your brain that will never, ever close. You take this to your grave. You will never, ever get over it. You would do anything, move the world, that having them, never being able to smell them again, never being able to kiss, don't hug, you don't get none of that no more. And everybody tell you it's supposed to be okay? That's bull. It don't supposed to be okay because the way it's supposed to be okay was you supposed to be left and they supposed to have been here. This is not right. All these kids being murdered and everybody's telling us it's okay. No. Mm -mm. Parents never get over it. They will take it to their grave. Never, ever. Birthdays, the worst. Anniversary dates, that's what we call when the day they were murdered. It's like a knife in your heart. You can't even pull out if you wanted to and make it right. It's like, I can't explain it. But you don't want nobody else to ever experience it because you don't know if they gonna get through it. A lot of people don't. They lose their mind behind this. We've had parents kill themselves behind and trying to get to their babies. And it, it's, it's just horrible. It's nothing like this. There's no medication they can give you because they give you something, they're gonna put you to sleep. And then that, that ain't gonna solve because when you wake up, you're thinking, where's my child? Where's my kid? And you look in the room, you're grabbing the clothes, you're asking everybody. So it, it doesn't work that way. Our spiritual leaders seem, they don't understand it either because they ask the strange questions. Like, did your child um, was he saved or something like that? Like that makes a difference. When it comes to this, it is not about that. This crosses every boundary. It doesn't care what religion, what race, what age. If you were short, you were tall, if you had money, you did. This crosses everything. And they need to understand this. There's nothing worse. Anything else in this world, you get a second chance. On this, we don't get nothing. We never get to see them again. We never get to say nothing. Everybody else gets a second chance. We didn't get it. It's the worst thing. It's so unfair. And we demanded that those son of a biscuits that kill our kids, they have to be arrested, charged, and convicted. Because this is the worst crime of all. No, there's nothing worse than murder. There's nothing. No. Give me a minute, please. Hello, um, my name is Kenneth Rachel. Um, can someone please call me back? I'm desperately in need of help. Um, my 16 month old child was murdered, and I don't know what to do. I'm not getting anywhere with the police or anything. So someone please call me back. Thank you very much. Paul, this is LaWanda with Justice for Murdered Children. I'm returning your call. I am truly sorry to hear about your 16 month old being murdered. My heart and prayers go out to you and your family. We're a nonprofit organization that helps families that have had a loved one murdered. Our mission is to assist them and to reduce the numbers of unsolved homicides. We felt we were left out the criminal justice system. Hi, Janet. This is Lawanda. How you doing? I'm doing fine. I was calling you because LAPD is doing an unsolved homicide um, website. So they will, so they need for you to give them Tony's picture. So you, yeah, yeah. Hi, Lucretia. This is Lawanda. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Hey, William. This is Lawanda. How you doing? Hey, Rose. This is Lawanda with Justice for Murdered Children. Oh, okay. I'll get the email to you. People usually think once we bury the kids, it should be over. We felt there has to be other steps to this, especially when we found out the people who killed our kids had not been arrested. That really blew our mind. And so we got together and created this organization called Justice for Murdered Children. And we started meeting other families that had the same situation, unfortunately. All three accounts? How can you get a hung jury on all three? Two attempted murders, you, your son, and then the murder of your grandson. 
I, I don't see how they can do that when you all were eyewitnesses. Yeah, victims and eyewitnesses to the crime. And I'm telling you, this man shot me and you saying, no, he didn't? And he didn't shoot my son, and I'm saying he shot me, my son, and my grandson. That one right there. See, that, that says something about our judicial system. I don't know. Where did, where, did, where did these juries come from? Because, see, your grandson, by him being a kid, that was a whole totally different thing. There's no way the jurors could not feel that. Unless the judge gave instruction, if you can't find him guilty on this one, then you can't find him guilty on the other two. No. That's why you break it up. Because there's no instructions like that. Because you can be found guilty on one and not guilty on another. We always believe in that in the, if we get through eyewitness and everything, then we got you. Now, they get the eyewitness, five eyewitnesses, and they still didn't get them. That's crazy. We don't get grants. The only funding we get is through fundraisers that we actually create. If I had committed a murder, and then I decided today I'm not going to commit murder no more, I'm going to change my life and create a gang intervention program, I could have got funded. But because I'm a victim of this crime called murder and my family decided that, hey, they want those people who committed that crime to be arrested, charged, and convicted, we can't fund that. This murder is a, a murder from a year ago. Basically what happened was we had our victim, Jeffrey Davis, he's an older male black, and his uh, associate, a girl by the name of Andrea Fowler, were filling prescriptions of Oxycontin down at Saddleback Pharmacy in Mission Viejo, and then they were selling this to a trade gangsters who were subsequently transporting it up to Washington State and making a huge profit up there. So while they were there counting the money they just got from this large sale, uh, Mel Black came up, stuck a gun in the window in Jeffrey's face and says, give me the money. And Jeffrey said, you're gonna have to kill me for my money. And he grabbed the gun and they fought over the gun. Uh, we were able to develop information that Andrea Fowler is a co-conspirator in planning this robbery to get money back from Jeffrey because he had been shorting her on the money. And uh, so she subsequently enlisted the aid of some other individuals uh, to help her get this money back. It was never supposed to be a murder, uh, but when the victim fought back, that changed everything. Here at Criminal Gang Homicide Division, we have a uh, uniform detail attached to us, uh, SCU, Special Enforcement Unit. They assist us in the enforcement and suppression of gangs and also to arrest and gather intelligence on certain gangs and violent individuals in our community. At that location, we're going to be looking for uh, any association of bloodstone villains. We're looking for an unknown caliber uh, revolver and we're looking for anything that, uh, uh, you know, just the general items that would show who has ownership there and also cell phones. A lot of times when we put a case together, we have targets of suspects, and we then are going to go back and do search warrants of those suspects. We'll utilize those teams to put together the tactical operations, um, put together the game plan and how to get, get to a location, make sure it's safe before the homicide detectives then go in there and actually search for physical evidence. This is Los Angeles Police Department. We have a search warrant for your residence. We need you to exit the front door and be guided by the direction of officers. Do it now, please. And we don't serve the warrant until everybody is set up. We try and call everybody out. We want it to um, be as safe as possible for everyone, the police and even the individuals that we're serving the warrant with. They will go into any house that we go into and they will search it primarily for bodies first. We're making sure that anybody who is left inside, we will be able to locate. We ask any individuals that came out before them, is there anybody else inside? It's me and my grandma and my wife. That's it. I don't know what's going on. A lot of times they'll say, nope, nobody, it's all clear. Uh, and then these officers will go in and make sure that nobody's hiding or that nobody was left in the back. We were able to 
uh, locate an individual that we were indeed looking for um, and detectives did want to interview him. They do believe that he had something to do with the crime we were investigating. Hey, get the fuck on, boy. take the information back to our community so when we're standing around 30, 50, 100 people, we say, wait, this is how the process goes. Kick back, relax, and that could ease the, uh, you know, the community as it relates to what's happening with the, the loss of life for their loved ones. Since we're talking about homicides with respect to gang homicides, I thought this would be a good way to segue into our conversation having what I consider the subject matter experts here, the detectives from Criminal Gang Homicide Division. Stenson is, is our front man. You know, our detectives need to make th these meetings, but Stenson's there. He's there at those meetings. He's our, our liaison between us and the community and, and a lot of the groups that we deal with. It's clearly, um, they're not catching any of these murderers. So if they are catching the murderers, what, you know, what's going on with the money that's not being used to prosecute these people because they're not being arrested? The biggest thing for the community is not knowing when these killers are apprehended. The victim's families want to see those arrests. We want to hear about them. Our children need to hear about them. Keep something in mind. Just because January 1st, 2013 arrives, doesn't mean we're not working cases a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. And then take it a step further, a case gets solved, well, guess what happens now? Now you're bringing the district attorney's office into another entity into this case. There's only so many hours in a day, but the fact of the matter is, is you get 100% from these guys. We need to get to those, 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 those questions yeah. Yeah. that you know that you are having right now about your kids yeah. and somebody's kids. We need to get to those because we don't have them often. And Lord knows, paying their salaries, y'all need to get to them right now. You hear me? Get to them right now. Please. I came involved in the Criminal Gang Homicide Division is there was a situation with me and perhaps impacting not only the hearts of the men and women in the uniform, but also those in the community. What we're talking about, what we need to do is we need to go home and tell our kids to knock it that F off with all this, you know, gang banging. Yeah. Now there's a lot going on, but this gang banging stuff is taking away a lot of young, talented kids. Right. It's been four years now, and they need to start seeing the faces of women like me, right. you know, because right. I can't get over it. Yeah, I get up every day and do what I have to do, but I miss my son every single day. July 18th, 2009, 6.30 on the dot that morning. I come to the door, and I'm thinking to myself, my son has lost the key again. Now I gotta get up and let him in. And I told him, this is your last, this is your third key. Unbeknownst to me, I look out the door, screen door, and there's two detectives with two notebook binders, thick. Well, I'm, I'm a seasoned law enforcement officer. I know what this is. This is not good. They got a job to do. We have a job to do. They got all these murders that's out here that's saw because people not stepping up because they know they're sticking to the codes of the streets. Yep. It's, until that change, they can always have a stack of murder, so why are we sitting here beating around the bush? They can't solve them unless the people help. That's right. Bottom line. When he told me and said, look, do you have a son named Amir Brown? I said, yes, I do. Do you know he was at a party last night? I said, no, he's 21. He's entitled to go to a party. I said, is there a problem? He says, well, Stinson, I hate to tell you, but your son was shot, and he didn't make it. My life has never been the same. If our kids are being murdered for stepping up and talking, they don't feel protected. So they're caught in a squeeze. My son was dead before he could even testify what happened. When I see a young black man walking down the street, he's afraid that he's not gonna make it to the corner. This has to stop. My son being clean shaven, 6'3", weighed 240, ran a 4'4 four, four to 40 football player, very healthy looking, was tying his shoe, and looked up, two young men, gang members, without provocation. The shooter produced a weapon, a handgun, and shot my son three times. 
I feel like people are so quick to, to label gangs that I'm gonna just put it out there. The white people aren't in here, in the hood, talking to people. The people that actually work in the community are not from the community. How do you know what we're going through? How do you know what we feel or anything? You guys don't live here. This doesn't happen in a lot of communities. Right. You're not gonna get criminal gang homicide detectives to come and talk in a community meeting like that. When Stenson stands up to a group of people and when he can tell and share that commonality of I've suffered a loss, you know, my child was gunned down, you know, gang violence in the same neighborhood. When he throws that down on the table, people really listen to him. They know he's not just some cop up there feeding him some bullshit. When my son was murdered, these are the men that helped apprehend the suspect and the person serving prison time now. So they have a very dear place in my heart. It was not real to me until uh, on the table, covered up with a white cloth. I remember touching my son from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet and feeling his cold body, the stiffness that had set in and realized that the life that I had known, that I had was responsible for procreating into this earth, now had moved on. And as a parent, Nothing will leave you as helpless and as meek and broken as that moment. As you all know, my son Jarrell was murdered, and the detective right here, Rick Gordon, he was the one who worked with that case and brought it to where the you know, guy was convicted. 75 years to life. That case is He stayed in touch with our family, and then I stayed in touch with them as well. I didn't sit back and wait. For three years, I had to go to court. And when it got turned up to the DA's office, what they talk about, a murder book looks like, is this fact. If I could add something on that, it was, it was so important for you to be there every day in trial because the jury has to see the family. They got to see that somebody cares. And, and that is so critical. When it came down to working criminal gang homicide division, when it came to being a gang intervention liaison, when it was posed to me, it took me a year to answer that call. I had to turn down the volume of life to hear the whisper of God. And when I heard that whisper, I knew that this is where I needed to be for the remaining of my years on this department. This is where I needed to put my best practices because Forgiveness is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Healing is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Many of us have lost somebody close to us. And for me personally, it's not about the badge and uniform at the end of the day when I sit at that table. It is about sharing and understanding that we all have been hurt. Some of us still hurt more than others. But if we could say something to one another, to encourage one another to say, hey, you know what? All hope is not lost. We don't have to go through life being bitter. Forgiveness is powerful. Unconditional love is powerful. The violent crime, it stops with us. We thank you, God, for the information and the meaningful God. dialogue that took place this evening. Yes. We thank you for every heart, mind, and spirit that has yes. been present. Nope. Nope. We thank you, God, for those who have traveled so far to be with us this thank evening. You. We pray, oh God, as we suffered I would separate ourselves to go to our separate homes. We leave each other physically, but not spiritually. Yes. We pray, oh God, that the families that we return to should be whole. They should be at peace. We pray this in your name, oh God, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, we need to put up the chairs and not the tables. You gonna put them up? Then. No, I ain't putting up nothing. Matter of fact, I'll put everybody in. I came, I came for my mom, I went in the 
over close here by my son. And I, cause I heard him cough. And, and as he was coughing, I hit the turn of his forehead. And he stood up and he was, he was hitting and then I knew it was somewhere in the upper body. And I said, son, he was grabbing at his neck. So I beat him to start choking him. I think that choked him. And I was like, son, oh my gosh, we gotta get you to the hospital. And when I ran out to the street, I was like, help, please, somebody help me, help my mom, my son, his girlfriend, somebody. And I seen the fire department come. And he parked, he was, he stopped right there. And so like, your life died. strengthen the family. Lord, I ask that you open up the kingdom of heaven yes. for the grandmother, yes. for the young girl. Yes. I ask God that you give the son a speedy recovery. Yes. Lord, I ask that you continue to hold on to this community. All the resources that we have that we need we ask God that you touch the community, touch these politicians, touch the congressmen, touch everybody, letting them know that we need more help here. Yes. We need help here, Lord. All the funding that's going around, that's given out to other places in the world, we need it right here in Inglewood. Right. We need it right here in Compton. We need it right here in L.A. We need it right here in Watts. Let them hear us, God. We need resources, oh God, so we can put this... Just, uh, just uh, stop into this nonsense. Yes. I ask God in the name of Jesus, we rebuke that demon in the name of Jesus. Yes. Yes. We rebuke him in the name of Jesus. I, I ask that you clear this neighborhood, God, with all this evilness. Yes. Lord, with all the programs going on, all the interventionists that's doing the work, I ask God that you continue to give them the resources yes. that we need to continue to better the families. You said raise up a child in the way they should be. And when they grow old, they will not depart. So we need to take our communities back. Yes. But we need, oh God, your help to give it to the people that can change some things. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray to you and only you. Let everyone that hears the sound of my voice say thank God. Thank God. And amen. Amen. We need to change some policies. I know that. Yes, yes. yes. We need some policy changes yes. in this yes. place. In 2009, things were so troubling. Cameras at that time were coming out and finding that hysterical mother, that hysterical wife, that hysterical girlfriend, and putting that camera in her face. And they were asking, well, how do you feel? That's such a stupid question. I'm just going to use a plain word for it. I'm not trying to be politically correct. It was a stupid question. And so when the media stopped coming to the vigils and the murders turned their backs on us and just didn't care anymore, and it was so obvious, uh, 
a higher power stepped in and told me to take it to the air. And I thought, I can't do that. I don't know anything about radio. And uh, I just found myself over there in that office one Monday, asking for a time slot and paying them for that 30 minutes that turned into Gang Talk Radio. The opinions expressed on the following program are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views of KTYM Radio, its staff, management, or clients. Well, hello, hello, hello. God bless you, community family, and welcome to Gang Talk with Sister Heron and Skip Townsend. I took on that name because I had a passion for homicide. I didn't go with any dedicated plan, I kind of backed into it. And backed into it because there was a need. There was no voice, no voice out here speaking to this. And I didn't really go with an objective other than to discuss this horror. I asked you here for a very specific purpose, and that was to share your a little bit about your uh, history and where, how it brought you to where you are now. The best gift in the show is to hear those wide range of voices, not just mine. Hear the men, hear the women, hear the kids, hear the public leadership. One day at school, I remember the school being shut down. Somebody said, the Crips are coming, the Crips are coming. And so I'm thinking, who are the Crips? Who has this much power to shut down the school? I, I, I kind of took a pledge right then within myself to say, uh, whatever has that amount of power, I, I want it in. I, I want it in on that power. I want it to be a part of that. What was the pull? Did you want to belong to that fellowship of men? Uh, was it glamorized? Uh, was it a safety net? Uh, was it just a sense of belonging? To see uh, young men, uh, you know, walking, marching together, hanging out together, that solidarity that they had, it gave them a status uh, in the community. So I, I wanted to be a part of that. That was a mission statement of Gang Talk originally, was to dialogue about this, try to get more people engaged to wake up, become sensitive to it. Don't treat it like it's somebody else's problem. It's right in your neighborhood. So it evolved that way. You know, listen to Ben, I was more infatuated and as well as in fear of the power that I seen these guys that had as I walked to and from school and to protect my little brother and my sister, I had to be a part of something because I didn't have the strength. So at that time I joined the community gang and um, from there on out, you know, my life has kind of like been really you don't have to explain it okay, because we've you. all kind of lived thank it. You. We've all been in this nightmare together from these beginnings that seem so innocent to what brings us here today. What is my role is to be a participant in the recovery. That's my role. And to encourage others to be engaged in a recovery and to be aware that a recovery is necessary. So that's my role. What got you here, Bishop? Thank you. Um, one incident that really changed my life is I got into an altercation and some little young guys shot at me and did not hit me. I turned around, it was bullet holes all in the front of my grill and tire went flat and I was not hit. But I went to go and grab a weapon to retaliate. Mm -hmm. And when I went to go grab this weapon, it always brings tears to my eyes because it's so true because I know how a lot of times people give testimonies, a testimony turns into a brag, but I just have to brag on how Jesus helped me this day because when I went to go get this weapon to retaliate, it was a Bible where I usually would keep a pistol. Yes. And that was a Saturday night. And the next day, I mean, God spoke to me right then and said, you don't get no more chances. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you don't get no more chances. That next day I went and got baptized by Dr. Garen Harding at Long Beach um, Great Open Door. And I was so wicked, I got double dipped. <laughs> I got double dipped. I'm a community partner. I'm a stakeholder in my neighborhood. I'm the neighbor. I'm the next door neighbor. I'm not the leader. I'm the next door neighbor. I'm the mother that raised my children under this threat. I'm the neighbor that's got bullet holes in my house too. They've shot up my neighborhood. I'm not unique. I'm just somebody that has a big enough mouth that thought it was worth 
investing my passion in this and everything else has come about because of that. If I wasn't engaged, I wouldn't be on the radio. I played Russian roulette with my life, you know, ever since 1977 when I joined the gang. I've been in and out of prison, in and out of institutions. Uh, I've been addicted to gang banging. I've been addicted to uh, drugs. I've been addicted to everything negative. Today, I'm trying something positive. You know, I believe in this second chance and I'm trying something positive. When I walked into the church of ceasefire meeting and the people that accepted me, it, it was a blessing for me. And it brought tears to my eyes knowing that the mothers and fathers that was there that have lost a loved one to gang violence and their child wasn't even a part of a gang. I felt that I was a part of their loss because there's no good thing about a gang. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's two ways out, death or imprisonment, unless you open your eyes and realize that take all opportunities mm -hmm. to turn over a new leaf. If I wasn't with these folks, I wouldn't have a radio show called Gang Talk. You see, they've all kind of come together out of that need for this healing that has to come about. So my job is just a mouthpiece. Really. We have to embrace you. Yeah. How are we going to close the door to our family? That's, That's right. who you are. That's right. You're a member of my family. You're a member of my community. If I close the door to you, you're going to stay angry. Yeah. You're never going to get a chance to know what it is to be redeemed. And as believers, we're supposed to practice redemption, aren't That's we? Right. Yeah. That's right. Okay, that includes you, especially anybody looking for it, huh, Bishop? That's right. I mean, I was the chief of sinners, but mm -hmm. God said I did it in ignorance and unbelief. So I didn't know no better, but now I know better, I do better. And you're teaching, you're teaching and sharing. I haven't lost my passion for it because my message hasn't changed. And my message is, how do we save our kids from killing themselves? Do you want to live, yes or no? And they have to answer me. And that's the hard question to ask these young men now. Do you want to live, yes or no? And you'd be surprised at the answer you'll get. That's the sad thing. You'll be surprised by the answers you'll get. I got a call early Sunday morning regarding a double homicide, uh, possibly related to a traffic accident in the area of 50th Street in uh, Figueroa in the city of Los Angeles. It was an early Sunday morning. It was a beautiful California day. There's a church right up the street with a lot of cars. You know, it's, it's unusual for a double homicide to occur like that. So we're supposed to here. protective sweep of the interior and uh, doing a final check on the uh, attic. Can we hold just to this block and the house? Are you guys good with that? We can close to 4-9 place and 5-1. Right. Still keep this tape, still keep flower tape, the flowers open. Yeah, yeah, yeah kick your yeah. units. When I got there, it was obviously a tactical situation. Does this yeah. other female have a freaking cell phone? Call her, hey. 
Give her an opportunity. You got a key to that place. If not, we're going to kick it in. Give her that option. We're not, we're not, hey, we're not going to play here. The uniform personnel, like our SEU and our patrol units, render a certain location safe, meaning to clear it or get the people out of it, be sure it's safe so I can do my job. We got the containment, we got set up, and we played it all the way out because we have to, because we cannot put these detectives downrange and start cutting, conducting investigations until we are sure that no one else is in that house. One guy, he set up his camera right away because he knew that you know, he was going to get pushed back. And he started filming, and I said, you know, hey, you do me a favor, you can't show the license plates. And I said, we, this thing's still maybe in play. The media tries to find out to give to the public, you know, obviously, is it gang-related? Was this random? A personal killing? That type of thing. And it, we give them what we know. And if we're not sure, we usually don't give it because we don't want to give up misinformation to the public. So you see the two cars behind us here. Um, those individuals somehow or another were involved in some form of road rage last night. They ended up here, at which point our suspects walked up, one of them carrying a shotgun. He basically asked, you know, what set you're from, basically asking what gang you're from. The homicides we investigate are usually senseless for no reason. He mistaken these two innocent individuals as gang members, and he shot them close range with a shotgun. About half a block down, apparently there's some blood down there on the street. So we're gonna swab that, right? Keep some in mind, all this brain matter and all this stuff out here, corners pick that up. Okay, so we'll photograph it, but they'll collect all that stuff. The first thing you need to do is we need to call um, SID print shed and see if there's room down there for these cars too. I'll do that right now. All right. So SID for electronics. In 1995, my only child, Reginald, was murdered in San Pedro. As of today, his case is still unsolved. It has been my dream for years to have an unsolved homicide summit after meeting so many of you families whose cases were unsolved. This summit will focus on the challenges and solutions surrounding unsolved homicides. You know, Luanda got involved with the family. She shared the grief. She lost a child to homicide. So she was able to you know, share her gr grief with other folks. And that, over the years, has, has really grown. And so then I have this little woman. I'm knocking on my door one day. My name is Lawanda Hawkins. <laughs> she changed my life. <laughs> She's the veteran. She's the OG that, that really started a lot of what we see. There was a period of time when uh, in law enforcement and on the news media or in TV uh, where we called cases cold cases. But when you really got to thinking about it, that was a term that, that, that never should have been used. And, and Lawanda was somebody who, uh, who reminded me of, of, of that. Who I feel I'm serving is the family of, of the victim. Um, to bring them some sense of justice. But by doing that, you also serve the community because you've taken a murderer off the street. I'm a ticked off old lady about what's happened in my family. And I know all of you are too. First of all, I am the sister of Nikki Thompson, who was murdered along with his wife, Trudy. And it took us 18 years to get to trial. Before Nick and Trudy were murdered, our only son, Scott, was also murdered. He was murdered by somebody that was out on bail for killing somebody else. And I was told at the recent parole hearing, Mrs. Campbell, it no longer matters about what this man did. It's whether he's been good in prison. Even though he premeditated our son's murder, strangled him, bloodied him up, threw him out of an airplane so the sharks would eat him. No parent ever expects to bury their own child. No parent. I wasn't prepared. Everything I had lived for at that juncture up to that point was to leave him in a better state than I was left in, but it didn't happen that way. I always view murder victims as lost souls. And there are a lot of lost souls that always are circling in my mind. 
and it's a, it's a struggle that I that I deal with. But it's a it's a struggle that's a good one in some respects because we can that it keeps me focused on pushing forward. We bond with a lot of the families of victims because we end up going through a, a very traumatic event with that family, and it's very difficult not to form a bond. Being there, notifying a family of a loved one's death, and then taking a, and investigating in that murder and to try to bring some closure to that family, it's hard to avoid a bond being created. I am troubled, yet not distressed, perplexed, but not in despair. I started in the prison ministry. I went to school to Long Beach Bible College. I earned my associate's degree in biblical studies. They had a program there to go down to East Lake Central Jail. I was one of the first ones to sign up. When I signed up, I was going down and ministering to the young gangbangers. I actually had to take off my suit and tie and show them my tattoos, let them know, look, y'all got the wrong person. I didn't grow up in church. This is me. This is where I came from, and I'm trying to help you. And for the Christian, there is no greater joy than to be in the presence of one that loves like no one else can love. So today, I'm not letting you know that I'm not going to eulogize a funeral, but eulogize a homegoing celebration. One gang member, I'll never forget, he was the one that had tattoos all over his face, all over his face, and in the group, he was the tough guy. But when it was after, when we had, after chapel, he was one of the ones that I was able to, that called me over in the corner and I was able to pray with him. And as I prayed with him, he just started crying. And after that, it touched me where I knew that was my calling. It's not a day of regret, but a day of rejoicing. Today we come to remember the life of Dora and reminisce of all the special moments that you had with her. Leading the Crips to Christ, leading the bangers to the Bible, leading the harlots to holiness, those are the people that I can minister to, to get them closer to God, to let them know that they can do something different than what they're doing. You know, sometimes God will take people and bring him with him to bring others closer to him. I said again, sometimes when people, God will take people to be with him to bring others closer to him. On last Friday, this church was full of gang members. Out of, let's just say 50 people that was here at a funeral, that, that was a Friday, the following Sunday, only one came, but he came to give his life to the Lord. I felt so good, I, job well done. It only took one, but it's, as it go, more come. My thing is, I teach one and save one. And I've done my job. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. This homegoing celebration for Miss Dora. Shabika said they used to call her Dodo. I really need you guys to know that she's in a better place. To the young men and the young women, don't get caught up in the foolishness out here in the streets. I lost my brother, he died, he got killed and died in my arms. So many things that I went through, so many things that my family went through, I didn't grow up in church, neither did my family. But when God saved me, I went back and got my family and baptized my mama, my aunties, and my little cousins. But now you, as a family, you guys got to come together spiritually and help each other out.
guys. This is Sal. Sure. Where at? Is the body still at the scene? Okay. So just just driving time. Let me get ready. All right. See you guys. For a number of years here during the Christmas season, we've done you know a Christmas tree, a tree decorating, and we've invited victims' families who've lost loved ones through homicide. This individual right here is my son, Brandon Deshaun Blanton. And I gotta say his whole name because he was more than just a statistic. The thing that I struggle with I don't remember his voice. What it is, it's, it's a place for them to begin to heal. The person who took my son's life has not been found. And I just pray, because I have cancer, I just really wish that I lived long enough to where closure can be brought. So could you please help us? Please. Thank you. Radio call, shooting, right here in the alley. The primary unit shows up. They're driving southbound. They get directed to the alley. The witnesses driving to the alley see the taillights of the car. I'm not sure if it's a suspect or a victim. They don't know. Eventually, they approach the car, find two people shot inside the car. So there's casings and one looks out of the car. RAs respond. Both of them not responding. They're pronounced here at scene. And I hear in the background, oh my God, oh my God, this man has been shot, this man has been shot. What? And as I hear that, I see the paramedics, I see the fire truck, and I see the police all go by me. And in the phone, I'm hearing the same thing, but I'm looking and I'm seeing it. I get out the car, I start running down the street. As I'm running down the street, they're putting a blanket over this guy. I call him on the cell phone, and as I'm standing there, I see the, the, the phone, his phone is lighting up under the blankets. I mean, it's it's really tough to sit through and listen to the stories. It's really difficult to see the children, but you know, there they, there's a certain connection, especially with the kids. You're the person, the detectives are the folks that helped catch the bad guy that hurt my daddy, hurt my mom, or shot my brother. The guy did get caught. He got 120 years. But to me, I still don't have no closure because tomorrow at my son's Christmas party, when he look out in the audience, his dad is not there because someone played God and shot him in the back of his head because of an argument. Hey, it's a place like this. I got cousin. I can express myself behind anybody trying to judge me. So when I try to tell somebody else, oh, you getting over it. You getting over it. What do you mean getting over it? What? He was shot in front of his home because his daughter was having an argument with some little thugs. And as being the protector as he was, he went outside to see what was going on. And as a result of that, he lost his life. There's that frustrating part of, wow, we've done so much, and people still have this, you know, violent streak. And I miss him very much. At the beginning, it was very hard for me. I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know what to do with my children, how I was going to do this. And I did what everybody does. Ask God. He's the only one. He's the only one that's going to help us. So I decided to raise up, get up, and keep on living. It's different for us grown-ups. You know, we understand, you know, it's a little more deep for, for the kids to see them smile and be able to give them something just on that day and not to be reminded that they're coming to the police station for something bad or some bad news, that they're here for something good. 
So I just want to go ahead right now and say thank you to each one of you for all the work that you do. Perhaps the money doesn't come, but you guys have the best rewards, and that's people like us being grateful that you're here. And I just want you guys, as you guys go home, think about all the blessings that we do have. And even though we don't have our loved ones next to us, but just their memories, or their memories is gonna keep them alive. They're dead until we lose those memories. And we don't wanna do that. I mean, one murder just affects hundreds of lives whether it be the victim's families, the detective's families, the neighborhood, the community, the news media, I mean, the churches, the hospitals. There's so many lives affected with the loss of one person through violent death.